Well, I hope everyone had a good time. We learned something. How many actually got to go to the Harry Potter? All right. That's pretty awesome. Huh? Who thinks every conference should have a Harry Potter party or something at a park? <laughs> well, we uh, we all appreciate you coming. What we're going to do to wrap up is we'll, in a minute, we're going to introduce the panelists here. But, uh, John, do you want to anything you want to do there, man? Yeah, so I want to thank you all for coming. And Progress had to take off, but they had a raffle lately, and they wanted to give this Quiet Comfort 35 acoustic noise canceling headphones away. Anybody want this? Yeah. All right. I think I, I'll awesome. just throw it in the crowd. Yes. I've got a list of names, none of which do I know these people personally, so I don't know. Uh, somebody else pick these. There's a list of 10 names on here. You have to be in the room to win. So the guy standing halfway in the room back there, you better walk in the room. <laughs> All right. So you'll get 30 seconds to respond to your name. If you can't answer to your own name in 30 seconds, you have bigger problems. Wow. The winner of the Quiet Comfort 35s are Allison Gale. Allison Gale. Yay! Yeah. Right. Now, I'm the next name on the list, Dan Wallin, as well as all the others. <laughs> Everybody's like, oh, she's here. Hey. Good job, Allison. Allison. Thanks for coming. Yeah, that'd be cool. Oh, there we go. Good, good. Yeah. I thought I was a photographer. Didn't know that, Mike. You did it, I just made it up. <laughs> All right, so to kick things off, uh, we're going to just have our panelists here kind of introduce themselves. So, uh, Stephen, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? My name is Stephen Fluin. I like long walks on the beach. No. Uh, <laughs> I'm a developer advocate on the AER team. Uh, my two core responsibilities are making sure that everyone here is successful, and no one else, uh, and then hearing all of your complaints, uh, as well as your successes, so that we can take those back to the team and do more awesome things. Thank you. Julie. I'm next. My name is Julie Lerman. I am not an Angular developer. Um, I'm more of a back end person. I'm in independent, uh, been for 30 years. I'm a software coach. I work with teams all over the world uh, with data access stuff and also domain driven design. Hi, everyone. I'm Mona Kutin. I work with John and Brian here in the developer, uh, cloud developer advocate team for Microsoft. And my role is to make the Galaxy developers happy and agile. Uh, my name is Mike Brocky. I work predominantly on the Angular CLI with the Angular CLI team. And my job is to make your lives easier as a developer. But if you have the tough questions, make sure you pass those to Steven. But with the tooling, try and improve your lives and make things easier. Seems like everybody here is trying to make somebody's life easier. I like it. That's it feels good. very touchy feeling. <laughs> That's a good thing. I like it. Thank you. Thank you. We talked about this. So to kick things off, I mean, obviously this is a show about Angular and the enterprise. We got different people from different walks of life, different experiences here, different stages of Angular, and many of you learned Angular yourselves at one point. Some of you may have been today. Some of you it may have been four or five years ago. So I wanted to first ask the panel, and I know Julie, you recently started getting into JavaScript from things like .NET and others. Kind of what's that experience been like to switch to using things like JavaScript, from tooling and from the language perspective? For me? Yes. <laughs> you, Julie, yeah. Yeah. Well, I I actually have yeah, I've been programming for a really long time, but I have not done front end and JavaScript stuff. I, do with my data access stuff. I do build a lot of like web API demos and things like that. And I was building yet another demo. And I wanted to have a front end that wasn't Postman or um, you know using a browser or something. And I did not want to use ASP.NET MVC again. And I've been hearing all about Angular, Angular, and I'm like, oh, I'll just try to run a front end in that. How hard could it be? <laughs> so, and I did not do like the way you're supposed to do it, which is sit down and you know, read a bunch of stuff, watch the videos, and all that. I just started coding in it. And, um, you know, it's kind of uh, backwards, three-letter word dash backwards. 
uh, way of learning. It's just my way, just diving in. And it was really, it, it was frustrating and fun because, you know, I understand the programming concepts. So I knew I should be able to do these different things, but I really had to learn. And I was happy to be fortunate to have guidance from some experts who wanted, wanted to see what could do with that. Um, and people were constantly saying, oh, you should use this, you should use that. And I'm like, I'm already learning 25 new things today. Don't add in another thing. But often those other things uh, were not. And then, you know, we're, somebody was talking about TypeScript, and people said, oh, you should learn TypeScript. That'll make it so much easier as a C Sharp developer. And I actually chose not to do that at the beginning because I wanted to really understand what was going on with the JavaScript, not have it kind of masked by. Using a, using a tool. So, again, I'm not doing any production code or anything like that with it, but I have, you know, I play with, I play with a lot. I've done enough to demos and lots of conferences and stuff with it. Excellent. Um, how many are, anybody here strictly server side before this week at all? Anybody really, really server side? I'm mostly front end. But okay, we got a few. <laughs> I'm sure you can sympathize a little bit, right? With the whole brave new world. And even you actually kind of talked about that, right? Uh, all the different technologies involved and uh, what we need to be working on. I did. So, I mean, going back to when I actually first learned Angular. So, I used to be a server side back then type person, right? So, I did kind of the three languages, which typically people don't do all at the same time. So, I was doing PHP, Java, and .NET. Uh, and then we really wanted to start building more and more interactive and engaging experiences. So, I started using jQuery. Uh, and then I found out about AngularJS and I started doing AngularJS. <laughs> And then I went to an Angular conference because I love the Angular Jeff, and they're like, hey, we've got this new version. It's a little bit different. And so my question was, was why? why? Why do I have to do all these things? Like, why, why TypeScript? Why, what, what's happening? I don't understand. Like, you're giving me technical reasons, but I, as a developer, I don't always want to pay attention to those technical reasons. I want to understand what's the context, what's the decision, where are we trying to go with kind of an ecosystem? Uh, and then I was fortunate enough to be able to join the team and Hopefully, I've started to answer some of those questions. Come on, I'm the end, you're the C. So. Okay. You want to know why I started Angular? <laughs> so, getting started with Angular, one of the, one of the things we heard a lot this week from people was talking about the CLI. We had a couple of talks about the CLI this week uh, the command line interface and something called the dev kit, which had five names in the last five months. When you say there were a couple talks, you just mean my two talks? Basically, yes. Okay. <laughs> it's called the Brocky Talks. Uh, but we, we had these talks here because over the beginning of Angular, just Angular, I wasn't saying Angular 2, it was just Angular. The beginning of when Angular 2 version 2 came out, everybody was not using the CLI. It didn't exist at the time. So when you want to start getting into it, it was difficult to start using how do I use System.js or Webpack or how do I get things wired up properly? Uh, and then along came this thing called the CLI. And can you kind of explain why the CLI, Mike, and what attracted you to it and helped you kind of decide to contribute to it? Yeah. Um, who here was in my talk on yesterday? Okay, you guys already have the answer to that. Um, <laughs> I talked about it during my talk. But why the CLI is that there is a lot of complexity. Um, coming from AngularJS, you just say, Hey, script tag source, and hey, look, AngularJS or Angular.net in JS. I forget the exact name of the file. But you drop a file in and you just start using it. And that's great. But the whole ecosystem for front end development completely changed uh, during the lifespan of AngularJS. So there was the idea of using ES6, which gives you transpile that. I mean, now that's sort of this built set in place. How do you set that up? How do you use CSS preprocessors? Do you use less or SAS or anything else? It really improve your experience as a developer to get things out to the clients, but there's more DevOps for front end there. Uh, not so much with server coordination, but you basically have to take something and transform it into something else in order to deploy it. And that's other technologies that you need to learn is a lot more of a headache. And the CLI and how I got started with it was, I didn't want to learn all this thing. And I didn't want everyone else to have to learn it. So I got involved uh, with the CLI as a, just the Open source contributor. I went out and I found the CLI repo. Igor had demoed it, I think it was MG Europe in 2014, 2015, and started to show what was going to be available. And I jumped in and just grabbed some issues and started playing with it, and that just grew and grew and grew. And it's become quite the tool. I hope you guys are pretty happy with it, and it's just going to continue to get better over time. 
I think one of my favorite things to kind of chime in is uh, you guys have been very open to the, you know, a lot of times we have the issues, of course, on GitHub. Sometimes it's not really an issue, it's more of like a feature suggestion, which is I've gone some of the time, I've just been soft. Um, and one thing, I don't know if anybody has taken the time to look through those, but there's a lot of great features, which Mike talked about some of these this week, like Matt, we might talk about a little bit later. But uh, just the, you know, you get some of these open source projects that they're very flexible and want the feedback, and then you have some out there that are not, and I'm pretty happy that everyone's been very flexible on the, the CLI feedback. So, and Angular in general, for that matter. <coughs> to reiterate that a little bit, the, there was a uh, report that came out from GitHub about their contributors to different repos, and in terms of the number of contributors to a repo, and that doesn't mean submit a pull request or modifying code in any way, it's people who are touching the repo, whether or not you submit an issue or I believe you could just favor an issue or anything like that. That Angular CLI of all the repos throughout all of GitHub, all languages, CLI for Angular is number five on that list. I believe it's five. It's definitely top ten, but actually, actually, actually ahead of Angular. It is ahead of Angular. Yeah, the Angular that was ahead of Angular as far as the repo touching. Seventy-four hundred in the last year, I think, is what it was. Wow, that's true. Great. Right. So thank you for everyone for all of your feedback. But yeah, we like to listen. We used to be built on System.js, moved over to Webpack uh, based off of community feedback. So Dan and I are going to ask some other questions for the panel that we've got up here. But we want to make sure we open the floor to you all. If you raise your hand, Dan or I will come and chase you down. Uh, so you can ask a question along the way. <laughs> and John's really fast, so you got to <laughs> run fast. Um, so just go along the way. Raise your hand if you have it. And just shake it up. <laughs> so before we uh, do that, one thing that I talked about, John talked about, and I think there's been some others, was, uh, hey, it's nice to run into server, right? You lie. But at some point, we do try to ship to production. I don't know. If anybody has that job where you just get to write code all day but never ship it, you know, let me know. That might be uh, interesting. <laughs> like, hey, cool. I get to write fun stuff all day and it never matters. But uh, we talked a little bit about containers this week. Uh, John went through that with a CI, CD type process, and Simona, I know you get to work with uh, cloud. So how does that play in the, I mean, as a front-end developer, do I really care? Because, I mean, I'm just writing TypeScript with JavaScript, right? Well, if you ever want your software to be used, that's not you. <laughs> so I guess you do care. Yeah, kind of. And I actually wanted to say that another thing that I really like about the Angular CLI is not only the fact that you can use this while you're developing and it makes your life so much easier, but it's also super easy to use it for production as well. And yeah, um, thank you for that. <laughs> and yeah, you can uh, definitely like move to, to put your application to production, right? And nowadays, cloud, cloud is definitely all the way. And so um, there's many options there, but obviously, uh, Azure is one of them, and to get there, um, it's very important to have a process in place. And I, as I was uh, talking from in my session, um, there's many uh, tools that you can use, and one of them is the OCI for uh, implementing your implementation version pipeline, and Angular CLI is also really helpful. Cool. Cool. What other clouds do you all have experience with using? I know someone mentioned Azure, but what about other cloud products? Uh, I need to I'm curious if you're in that category. Does anybody use the cloud on the panel? I use the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> I the cloud. Yes, you do. Uh, so, I mean, I think my goal and my hope is that the Angular team and the CLI team in particular can really, at some point in the future, spend more time on the end-to-end -end deployment story. So not just giving you code, which it does say you do an ng build dash prod and you're going to get AOT ready to go code that you can deploy in kind of any uh, CDN, any sort of environment that you want. Uh, but then how do we take it to the next level and help you optimize for those endpoints, whether it's Azure, whether it's AWS, whatever. Um, because there, there's this configuration that you can do that makes Angular apps even better, right? Like HTTP uh, to push or server push. You can actually take seconds off of the load time of, of the application if we can use our knowledge of your route and your our knowledge of your application because we have all these fantastic semantics. That would make it even better. So I hope to at some point see uh, ng deploy for all of the clouds. Ng deploy. 
deploy dash dash Azure dash dash Firebase dash dash whatever. Yes. <laughs> you are. Oh, what I just heard is <laughs> Stephen owns DevRel basically for Angular. He just said it's going to happen, and Mike is going to make it happen this weekend. That's right. right. That's right. By Monday. <laughs> uh, before anything else, I want to clarify that I get a lot of credit for the Angular CLI, but I am just a member of the team. Um, Hans Larsen and Philippe Silva do brilliant work, and when I come out to conferences, which I attend more than they do, um, that I just get to be the face of the brilliant work that they do as well. Um, I contribute code as well, but they're definitely uh, very instrumental to the success of the CLI. Mike is also the guy who gets a lot of the uh, negative feedback about the CLI because he's out there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, I can show you a few Twitter mentions of uh, a few things that. Uh, Hey, Mike, you uh, broke my app. Yeah. <laughs> you personally. Yeah, but that's believe me, I definitely have to admit one um, okay, Oh, deploy. So <laughs> you're doing it this weekend. That's yeah. so, well, we, we've discussed the idea of deploy. We definitely want to get there. Um, but to so have to run deploy dash dash dash, I don't think the semantics of that work. But if it's some sort of configuration option, uh, where you just say deploy, but your app already has a configuration of how and where to deploy your application, would be a much easier solution and much more um, ergonomic for developers to use. Um, but we want to have some sort of infrastructure of basically, hey, this is what you need to implement to be a deployment target or something. Um, not sure exactly yet, but we're definitely talking about uh, how to deploy and basically say, all right, if you cross this T and dot this I and do this, and stand three meters to the left, then perfect. Uh, you can be a deployment target and uh, be able to have your CLI apps deployed to a certain place. You're saying there might be an API for deployment targets? <laughs> Maybe. I, I'm not allowed to commit to anything. You'll yell. <laughs> <laughs> that would be easier if you guys were next to each other because I feel like I'm at a <laughs> Sorry, you're, you're kind of breaking up there. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. You're, you're the gatekeeper. So, yeah. so not using Angular, right? Uh, not, not having have deployed it. I do have an, my experience with Azure is being able to link it up to GitHub and that. So when I'm pushing to GitHub, it automatically deploys to the other cloud clouds that have something like that also, that kind of integration. Simona, do we have anything like that in the clouds? Oh, we went to Azure. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's what I use. I wonder if the other ones have it too. But I mean, is that they all do? What, yeah. what you what you want to do with deployment is that kind of above and beyond that kind of capability. Um, I I view the deployment story uh, in terms of like continuous deployment. I don't think it makes sense for developers to always have that in their hands. Um, to basically have everybody on your team say, "I'm deploying," "No, I'm deploying," and they're pushing their own repos. I think it makes sense. Uh, to try and centralize it, hence configuration versus a uh, option uh, within there, so that it becomes a story that's integrated with your CI, so that you can deploy as part of that. So the CLI could potentially handle all that scenario uh, based on based on a GitHub to run some sort of continuous integration that would then get packaged up and deployed based on some implementation of some theoretical um, deploy <laughs> in the, uh, API. So deployments can be difficult, or they can be easy, right? If you have a simple one that goes from GitHub, you can just pull it into any cloud provider. Well, not any, probably most cloud providers out there. Uh, but what's, what gets trickier is Mike's hinting to is, what do you want to do when you deploy? Like, if you just want to send the code there, that's one thing. But maybe you've got to set environment variables. Maybe you've got to do different kinds of builds. There's other things that go into play. And as you mentioned, control, right? Maybe you don't want a thousand people at your company deploying. Server side rendering is a really good example. Exactly. All right. Well, we have any questions from the crowd? Yes, we open up the question. It's your chance to ask. If we have one right here. All right. I'm going to go to this guy first because he's closer. Yep. Very good. So, uh, with Angular C Live and uh, NGU, it's usually just an approach that table uh, version. It won't be great if like, there is a way to uh, install uh, an older version from kind of like where an old version and I want to be read the uh, a specific issue on this uh, version. I like an easy way just to uh, get the isolated. As would have like uh, trying to explore Angular 5.0 right now, and there is no easy way to just uh, explore 5.0. So, as of right now, 
right now, the way the CLI is set up is to always install the latest version of what it has. Um, as of right now, the CLI won't install anything from 5.0, um, but that will be coming when 5.0 is there. And you're talking about going backwards to install like Yeah, I'm talking about like giving it that it would be like NGU, the 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 NGU, I'll let Stephen handle this part of it, and I'll just set him up for that. But I, there's something I want to comment on. But part of it, it just being Angular, is you're installing Angular, and you'll get the latest version and get all the latest greatest, greatest features. And the idea of trying to install a lower version kind of goes against that. Um, that's where I'm setting you up, and you can take that off. But I want to say one other thing, is that if that's something you really want, because I really don't see that getting implemented in the CLIs, uh, default schematics, but based off of schematics, you can define your own new app template. And if you want to go back and you want to use Angular 2.1, uh, Stephen will talk you out of that. Um, but if that's something that you want to set up and that's the version that you want to use within your organization, you can set up your schematic. Because uh, one thing I did get to show during my talk today is that while you can set up your own collection to say, hey, use your own collection, you can do that at the global level as well and specify a new app part, uh, schematic. So Specify the collection, specify the target or the schematic that you want to use for new app generation. So, first of all, I think if you want to do that in, in a minor way, we failed because it, like between version 2 and 2.4 or version 4 and 4.4, there should be no breaking changes. So, there should be, there should never be a reason that you ever want to go down within a major version. Uh, but within a, within a major, across major versions, that I can definitely see that use case. Um, I think schematics, as Mike said, is definitely going to be the answer to that. Um, and then theoretically, I mean, I think today or any version since we uh, deployed schematics, you could actually just install, you could violate the peer dependency and install an earlier version of the schematic, and it should just work like that. And then, I mean, as always, you can always go back and install an earlier version of the UI that's tied to an earlier major release. But uh, if, if that's still a use case that you want, buy an issue. He's going to meet you behind the gym. <laughs> um, for package block and uh, yarn, if you have package block, you we'll just go to that or you still use yarn. Which one should you use? NPM yarn. Go. <laughs> I like yarn, but NPM is great. <laughs> <laughs> so, is there problems between the two? I guess is the question that. There would be a reason you would choose one or Yes, there are problems with both. Uh, <laughs> I, I like NPM. Uh, I, <laughs> um, the one thing that I will say is that both are, both are good tools. Uh, both of the, uh, provide the ability to lock down your versions uh, through yarn.lock or backlog. What I would suggest either way with whichever one you choose is to get everybody on your team on board with using one or the other, but not both. All right. Yeah, yeah that, that's where we do. We like meet me out back. And, and <laughs> and out just so folks know, uh, NPM uh, and Yarn used to have significant speed differences, right? Yep. Uh, until I think it was NPM five, uh, really sped things up considerably, and now they're actually relatively close to each other in speed. Yeah, and a lot of stuff you can do offline with both now because uh, they both cache. So. Uh, so first of all. You know, thank you for the Angular framework. I love it. Thank you for the conference. It's very enlightening. Um, just a really small question regarding uh, Angular and how the styles are done. Um, I know that the uh, I know that, that the interfaces on Angular are not preceded with an I. How come? Uh, okay, uh, John knows my opinion on this, but that's probably a Stephen question. I'm guessing. Or John, if you, if you want to answer it, go for it. Well, my opinion happens to be the same as what I was told by the Angular team. So I'm just going to reiterate that. Uh, I don't like eyes. Dan likes eyes for his interfaces. But uh, in general, the Angular team, when we talked about this, because I didn't quite frankly want to even put the style guide, so it's not in the style guide, on how you prefix your interfaces. Uh, but all of Angular is written with interfaces without the eye, correct? So, right. maybe you can address why they chose that. Is that just that? So I, I think. One of the side effects of using TypeScript is that now IDEs are very, very good at telling you what an object is with a lot of really great context. Uh, and then, so then having extra characters in all of your variable names, if you're, if you're doing it for interfaces, why aren't you also doing it for properties? Why aren't you also doing it for services? 
Um, so uh, my hope is that we, we build such or we're leveraging such good tooling that you never have that question anymore. Like you always know this is an observable of an observable of, of an array that has a string and any in it. <laughs> kind of like the old uh, was it Hungarian notation? Is that where we yeah, prefix yeah. variable names and stuff? Well, and I think that's a really good point because as the toolie, you know, uh, what is it on the command click or whatever, you can get a little peek type thing. Yeah. Like in VS Code, you can VS Hover. And I think that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, for me, and I know a few of you in here probably have done that before. It's more a creature of habit, I think. Um, but I'm with you. It's the tooling. A good example, we used to do underscores on our private fields, our properties. And it's like, why? Um, yeah, or some people well, would We don't them. do that anymore. <laughs> uh, well, you know, you, you can. It doesn't yeah, matter. Except each each have project to... can design <laughs> their own style. Uh, to that point, I believe, and don't quote me, that there's a setting within the CLI when you generate an interface of whether or not it gets prefixed or not. Because I also came from .NET where I used to put eyes for interface, and I implemented interface. So for, for me, it, it's all about how do we reduce the cognitive uh, overhead of doing anything in the code base. And so the most important way to do that is to have a standard. So whether or not the standard is right is almost less important than having one. Because I mean, like, for example, we don't typically suffix services, but we do suffix components. Um, because, because it's just a pure ES 2015 class, you can't necessarily tell if it's a component. So using that in the name uh, is part of the best practice. So a naming convention that we kind of just picked up was having a dollar sign for the observable that's a suffix. That, that, is, that is very, very popular across the ecosystem. Uh, the Angular team did not include that in the best practice based on community feedback that we had. Yeah. yeah, and I just had someone ask me about that as well. And I think this is, Mike, you kind of hit on it. Really, <coughs> like the style guide is, it's a guide, right? What really matters is, does your team have a standard? You know, because that may be totally different than what the style guide had. I think that's ultimately what matters. But I'm also with Stephen that, you know, the less uh, boilerplate extra characters, the better. So I'll give you an example of a big company that deviates from the Angular style guide, Google. Uh, <laughs> I think within Google, I hope I'm not, not revealing anything. This can take me if I say anything too bad. We don't put spaces between our bracket and our import within Google. <gasps> oh. Is this what you like talk about in your family at night? <laughs> <laughs> Have a rough day, honey. I, stood, I put spaces in my brackets and Igor got mad at it. <laughs> the auto formatter took care of it. <laughs> Have an auto formatter. <laughs> Linting concept. So. Yeah, prettier uh, C-Lang. Pick your own auto formatter and call it a day. Is it C-Lang or Clang? I've heard it called Clang, but it just sounds weird. Clang 30. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to like, kill the code of conduct. Like, can't do something. <laughs> that worries you. Really. Uh, yeah, so I have a question regarding the Ionic stuff. So let's say Ionic has started working on, on like, uh, you can create apps as well as the PWS as well as the desktop apps using Ionic. So what is the future of, let's say, for the iOS, the Swift and the Android development kit in, like, probably down the memory today? So uh, no one up here works uh, I mean, we work directly with the Ionic team, but no one from the Ionic team is here. So I will try and, and represent it what I or try and answer the question, but definitely go to them and get the real answer. Um, so the, the question was, what's the future of like uh, iOS, Android support for them? I, I think, so they are relying under the hood on the Cordova project, and I think they contribute back to it. Um, so, Cord so there's two parts of it. There's Cordova that's handling the uh, JavaScript to native API translation. So that, that is a successful project that I think is going to continue for, for a long time. Um, and then they are building a component library that morphs based on the kind of target destination. Um, so I, I think that there, that's definitely the strategy for them, which is we want to have this native look and feel, and we do that via their component library. I, I worked on an Ion project, and we were just testing the application and developing the application with both. Uh, iOS and Android and mine and so like they go and using the Ionic components so it's totally doable. 
Now, going back to your question, were you also asking that more like a native type thing, like native script type of approach? Yeah, and I don't know on that. We have to go to the team. So, so I mean, the partners team isn't here anymore, but that, that's their whole idea is instead of having a web view, like Ionic does via Cordova, uh, the native script team wants to use Angular more heavily, and then they built a custom render layer that takes these pure conflicts, these pure JavaScript conflicts, like classes, change section, uh, and then it just manifests it. Instead of a two HTML, it manifests it to uh, native widgets, and then it's custom native widgets depending on the platform. So these are different strategies that have different focus on. Yeah, theoretically, you'll get better performance on animations and motions and things like that using something like native script, it's closer to the render engine. Uh, but also Ionic, I know, is working heavily on the PWA story as well. So there, it really kind of depends what you're going to pick and choose these days. I don't think the, the final chapter of the mobile story with the web has been written quite yet. No. Uh, and that whole mobile conversation of using mobile web with an embedded Ionic solution or a native one with native script is going to get solved in a travel long panel, a much larger conversation. We have, just a quick time check, we have about five minutes to go. I have a quick bit of housekeeping to mention that I was just brought up to here, and then we're going to wrap up by uh, having our panelists answer a question, final parting question. But Dan, you have some people to thank first? Oh, yeah, so first we want to thank, I don't know if any of our sponsors are still here, but hey, we got one in the back there. So um, we really want to thank all of our sponsors up here. Everybody give them a quick round of applause. scenes of conferences that you don't get to hear about as the sponsors really help out a lot. So uh, we definitely want to thank them for everything they've done and please check check out what they offer. Yeah, without them we don't get a lot of the things we have at these nice events like parties and Harry Potter things and food and food's kind of nice. Food's good. I like yeah. food. I like food. Good. All right, a little bit of housekeeping here. I was just told, hey John, make sure you let these three people know that your Google Home is up front and they will not be here tomorrow. So if your name is Christopher Hayes, Christopher Hayes, Jordan Holiday, Jordan Holiday, and Thomas Jaysk, J-A-E-S-C-H-K-E, that's you, okay. So Christopher Hayes, Jordan Holiday, and Thomas, uh, if you want to get your Google Home, uh, make sure you go pick up on desk before you leave, because uh, someone else will take it home with them. Yes. And you wouldn't want that. Everybody's wondering, well, where's mine? That was part of a workshop thing they did. So. Yes, yes. I don't get a Google Home, sadly. No, your name was not on the list, Dan. No. <laughs> the next one. <laughs> uh, so I want to thank our panel for coming here. But as a final parting question, uh, I always like to have inner panels. With, you know, what are your thoughts on the event in Angular? Kind of any tips you might have for our audience here, because this is a conference about Angular and the enterprise. Any advice that you all have from your perspectives on how they should proceed? I'll go first so that I no one steals my answer. Uh, <laughs> join the community. Angular is really, really successful because we have a lot of people that love to share their knowledge and share their success and share their stories. Uh, if you're not already attending a meetup or you're not already in a mailing list or following some cool people on Twitter, do that because people are here to help you. And by asking people for help, you're going to learn a lot faster. Uh, the whole team, if, if any of this feedback gets back to us, we're going to make a better product, and everything will be better. So join the community. I'll go next, since you already stole everybody else's answer. <laughs> Actually, I, uh, I'm thinking more about all the all the stuff that's coming at us constantly, and how you keep up, and what you learn, and what's interesting. And I know that for work, there's things you have to learn, right? But there's also, you know, there's so much else that's maybe of interest to you. And, and sometimes people think, well, I can't, I shouldn't do that because I don't have time to become an expert in it. But it's really okay to like dabble in things and play, play with them. Even going to a talk that, you know, is something you've been curious about, but maybe it's an advanced session, but you don't even know the beginner stuff. Just go, let it wash over you. It'll be somewhere in your brain, and maybe someday you'll, you know, have an idea and go, "Oh yeah, I remember hearing that thing." And then you can go Google, or they like to say, "I like to stop that Google thing." Um, you know, you can go Google the rest of it. But don't, don't be afraid of all of that information and all of the things that you know that really. Um, 
unfortunately, Angular. <laughs> uh, yeah, my advice would be like Angular has the best community ever, or at least that's what I feel. And um, exactly, go to Meetup, create your Twitter account, make sure to follow the Angular team on us only. But since we've already said all that, I'm just going to invite you to join the Cloud Adventure and maybe join some of the serverless adventure. Make sure that you run your continuous um, integration pipeline in the cloud. Uh, and uh, yeah, you'll find JavaScript there, you'll find Node.js there, and it's going to be a familiar place to be. I have a different aspect of the community. Um, sure, it's great to go out there and consume and read Twitter and pull in information for yourself, but it's also great to push information as well, whether or not you're submitting a pull request or not. Um, I started with the Angular community without even really getting involved on GitHub at all. I didn't know Git when I first started using Angular at all. Um, I just started I started playing with AngularJS and I wanted to learn more. So I didn't or find questions on GitHub and it helped me out. And I decided I had a little bit of free time at work at the time. And I started reading other questions that I didn't necessarily need the answer right then and there. But I'd read questions to see what other issues other people were having. And I was like, hey, I can try and help. I'll go read the source code. So I did that. And I started answering lots of, lots of questions on AngularJS on Stack Overflow. Um, so I kind of got involved more so by contributing, even without a whole lot of knowledge. I'm sure I could write a small little Angular JS application, but I learned a lot more by going in and reading the source code. So go out there and read and get involved um, and increase your own knowledge. Not just with Angular, but with anything. There's a lot of stuff being done with uh, open source uh, that's even beyond JavaScript. So I know a lot of the uh, .NET stuff is open source as well. Lots of really cool information to find out there and read. Good feedback. Dan, do you have any final thoughts? Uh, so I was just going to ask you. So uh, go. <laughs> For me, it's a little less technical. One more? You can add one more? Oh, uh, no, I'm sorry, Mark. Our time is up. Oh, no. yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, conferences are great um, for sessions, and you can learn a whole lot in the sessions, but talk to people. Sit down at a table where you don't know anybody. It's great because you can have different conversations, and you may be thinking that you can use something one way and come up with a completely different idea and a different approach uh, by talking to other people. Um, Speakers are demystified. Brad Cream stood up here a couple of days ago wearing a shirt that says, sit with us. Or you can sit with us, I think is exactly what it said. But yeah, feel free to ask speakers, talk to speakers, talk to other attendees. There's, from the community aspect, you learn from other people as much as they learn from you. Uh, so feel free to talk to just about anybody at the conference. Without. Like, Good advice. That, that kind of rolls into what I was saying too. It's less technical. It's more, uh, I've been, I've been looking back at like my career in software in the last uh, two decades now, thinking about how I started and how I engage with people and why I do what I do. And a lot of what I do, I, honestly, I get, I get a personal value out of it. I enjoy helping people and I enjoy hearing that, hey, something you helped me with really made a difference with X, Y, Z. And it started me thinking about, you know, how can we be better as a community overall? Because we hear a lot of stories about people uh, at conferences or on GitHub, other places, or Twitter, kind of flaming other people. And I think there's the, we have a different persona online. I know my kids deal with this at school with bullying and text bullying. Uh, we turn into different people sometimes online, or maybe we're just not as uh, good as we'd be if we were face-to-face -face person and uh, sensitive to their own perspectives. So I always like to think about before I answer a GitHub response or a PR or anything else, how would I like to receive this information? Think about that way as you're entering this stuff. I absolutely think it's great for you to contribute and consume the information Stephen and Mike have suggested. But think about how would you like to consume it? If somebody told you your baby stunk, you know, baby, you know, Stephen, your baby stinks, Angular's bad, I don't like this, broke my project. Think about how somebody would like to receive that. Also, the positive side, right? Something you did really worked well for me. I think the better we can be to each other on the online community, the more people who will come and join the community. There's a lot of people scared to join the online community because they don't want to be involved in the virtual that could be out there. So I'm just trying to make it a better place in general. I think it's a good thing to do for all of us. I like that. And I'll bet you, Stephen and Mike, you probably have some stories you could tell there, mm -hmm. good or bad, right? I, absolutely. I mean, you'll see a lot of like X versus Y online. 
Um, and we always try and just basically ignore those because it, it almost never helps because you've got people that come from one background or come from another background um, and, and trying to compare these things like head to head, it, it's not helpful to a deeper understanding of either of them. And so you'll notice that we kind of leave all those alone and hopefully you never see one that says, uh, this is why Angular is better um, because we, we do want everyone to succeed, right? There's a lot of great ways to build applications uh, with the web, with other technologies. Uh, and it's never a, a X or Y, right? It's how can we all make the ecosystem a, a healthier, happier place? X is a much better letter than Y. Oh, <laughs> there we go. There we go. It's just bad. It's just bad. Um, well, I'll wrap up with uh, first off, thank, thanks everyone again for coming. Uh, I, John, and I'm sure everybody up here on the panel and uh, the other people that were able to present with you and talk with you, I've learned actually several new things this week. Uh, just from interacting with people, you know, new, for instance, VS Code plugins. It's like, have you tried this? No, I haven't tried that. So thanks for sharing what you know. And I'll wrap up with, I've had a lot of questions lately, um, not just this week, but over the last few weeks on, you know, how do I get better at this? And Mike kind of touched on this earlier. Um, one of the big things I do is, you know, fortunately, especially compared to the initial version of AngularJS docs, you weren't around then, Stephen, but you know when it first came out, there weren't a whole lot. Um, but Angular, you know, they worked really hard on the, the docs, and uh, there's a lot of good stuff out there. But what happens when you do hit something when there's not a lot of docs? And Mike kind of touched on what I was going to say. If you haven't gone into the docs before, and I'm talking about the API docs, uh, they'll always have a link directly to the source code for the given thing you're interested in. And I can't even tell you how many times I've figured out a either a better way to do something or a different way to do something just by taking a peek at, well, what are they actually doing with this? Or maybe you find a unit test uh, related to that. And then you're like, oh, that's how you do that. So I think it's taking that just, even if it was five minutes a day, and you know, I, I, I'm one of those, uh, I don't know, bleeding, gushing edge type people that love to always be learning. That's the fun of our job, I think. I think if you just spend just a little bit of time every day digging into one aspect, you'd be amazed uh, how quickly your knowledge will grow that way. So I think it's kind of just on us to keep pushing forward, be nice to others while we do it, and uh, keep the community you know, going really well. So with that, John, let's wrap up. Yeah, and thank you. Thank the speakers. Uh, have a big round of applause for the speakers still here. Do a great job. Did a great job this week, and hopefully you all had a good time. Did you enjoy it? Yeah. All right, good, good. Maybe we'll do it again another time. Awesome. Next year at the Great Wall. <laughs> all right, thank you all for coming, and I hope you had a great week. Thank you. Safe travels, everyone.